Theater Talk and actors and directors who put on the show. We're talking playwrights and designers who you'll want to know. From the very first rehearsal to the final curtain call. We, we might, might be off, 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 off Broadway, but we're talking about it all. Cause we're two local gals with global pals. It's everything, everything, everything here. With Benita and Ellen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Everything Theater Podcast Backstage Episode Chat. I'm Ellen Cribbs. And I'm Benita Zahn. Hi there, everybody. <laughs> so, Benita, we got to chat because our last talk was about the Tonys, and I know that you watched. What Overall thoughts? Um, look, I'm a sucker for, these, for this show, so let me just put yeah. that right out there. Um, it bothers me that I had to, you know, basically spend money because I'm convinced I didn't get the seven free day you mm. know, with trial. Mm. So that bothered me. Um, I thought it went very smoothly doing the honors that way. In some regards, I felt personally it was nicer in terms of the honor. It yeah. wasn't, you know, here's an honor and mm-hmm. okay, we'll get back to the honor. Yeah. It was concentrated honors you were able to focus on for the most part because not all of the awards happened in that uh, paramount i loved it and then you had the showy show which is now taking uh, all kinds of criticism for selling broadway well Mm. come on gang but yeah isn't that what these shows really besides yes there are awards but they're twofold it's one is to, to honor and the other is to keep business coming so we can watch those we've honored yeah, and after being shut down for 18 months, like we deserve a celebration, just a big show off moment. I Agreed. loved it. <laughs> right? I do. Yeah. I you know, you bought you you got a hold of Paramount, you did the online. Yeah, I did the the free trial. And my husband was like, as soon as this is over, we're canceling. I'm so annoyed at this. <laughs> but, Same. You know, and then of course, you know, my husband's going, Oh, there's sports here that I can't get otherwise. Uh-huh. Next you know, I'm gonna be dropping five bucks a month for a few months, you know. Yeah. five dollars you know but i but the numbers were down you saw that the ratings were down yet again yeah yeah um and i don't know what you do to make that better um the show is great yeah. i think that there is such a disconnect and i, I mean, in some ways i'm going to blame the politics in the country you yeah. know when you and i posted about this and right away and i posted on my page and somebody's like well are those elites going to be wearing masks you know, would you get off your high horse? Could you, this is why we can't have nice things. Right. <laughs> you know, how about you You take a moment and read that, yes, they had to be vaccinated and yes, they had to wear masks and come on. Could and we I, put the ax down? I was actually very surprised at the difference from the Emmys to the Tonys because the Emmys, I mean, everybody was at tables, not like next to each other, you know, in an auditorium, but still pretty close, not masked, you know, uh, tons of people coming up on stage at a time to accept an award. Whereas right. the Tony said two people max, that's it. You have to take turns to accept right. these big reward awards. Yeah. Right. So. Agreed. So let's, let's just try to play nice. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> so yeah i'm with the show love yeah and and what did you think about aaron to oh my God. nominated yeah i'm all, <laughs> i'm so glad he got it that would have just been heartbreaking had he not but um no i was very excited for him and i thought i thought his speech was really well done too yeah really nice speech Great. you know you and i were having a conversation and uh i it's a guest that we will have on a, a later show Mm -hmm. um the whole effort for improving diversity yeah and you look there are some who say the theater has always been diverse and others will go are you kidding me (laughs) um gee what about look we can always do better yeah but it's not just about plugging in people and numbers it's about being thoughtful conscious respectful uh, projects that are appropriate, that speak to the heart of people and the times, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in an upcoming show, we're going to have a wonderful diversity uh, professional join us. And you know, it's not just about, uh, not uh, just, it, it's not only about color, but it's about the diversity we have as abilities also. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
and how do you make it's one thing and uh you know me and names she from oklahoma and she sang in the beautiful red velvet dress Stoker, yeah Alex, right um she's one mm-hmm. what about all of the other incredibly talented people with physical challenges yeah mm-hmm. how, how do we inc- best incorporate them think of all the artistry that we're missing yeah absolutely so, so I'm looking forward to that that program. Yeah, me too. And I was just reading an article today from um, you know one of the kind of Broadway opinion articles, and uh, they were saying, "Are you ready to go back?" Because this pause made a lot of companies sit back and think about their policies and how they can do better. But it's kind of the question of who's actually going to do what they said they were doing during this pause, and who's going to revert back to their old ways. Exactly. You know, and yesterday was yesterday. Mm-hmm. And if we really don't embrace tomorrow, we're in trouble. Yeah, definitely. You know, and it's not an indictment. No. It doesn't, or it doesn't have to be an indictment. You know, mm-hmm. let's hear it and let's go forward. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited for that episode. <laughs> And you're gonna love her. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so a lot of stuff going on. You've got something coming up. Will it, yeah. post, will it hit before or after? Um, after, unfortunately. Yeah, it's uh, this weekend. We'll post next week. But um, yeah, stage reading of the Lady of the Camellias at Schenectady Civic. Um, so that's exciting. And and that that's it for me for a bit. <laughs> I'll keep plugging. We've got um, Cabaret coming up. The two of us productions down in Copake. I know you need a passport to get there if you're living. <laughs> you know what? There's some really cute places to stop and have a bite. It's a nice ride, except uh, we could go Thursday driving home in that rainstorm. I have never, Ellen, in my life had rain jump up and cover the, it was like I drove into, and I didn't oh. see, I couldn't see any you know, water. I mean, look, there were sheets of water, but it was like a tidal wave hit my windshield, not once, but twice. And you go, you know, I'm a nine H and if you don't know, it's a, it, it's a back road, you know, like, yeah. oh, please dear God. Um, but the show will be worth it. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, second and third weekend in November, put that on a cabaret. I'm Fräulein Schneider. Uh, put that on your 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 book. And uh, props to everybody who is uh, local. If, if you're hearing this locally um, in almost Maine, lovely um, notices yes. they've gotten. They got for um, their production up at uh, for Homemade, which is now at the DiSarno uh, Art Center in uh, right downtown in Saratoga. So a lot of good stuff going on. Fantastic. Love it. Should we jump to our question of the day? Because I've slapped lip enough now. <laughs> I feel like that was like such a Sesame Street like <laughs> transition. I've been watching too much Sesame Street. It's the question of the day. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought, uh, because yeah, we're talking about the Tonys and we said uh, all three musicals nominated this year were jukebox musicals because of the weird half season. So we wanted to know what people thought about jukebox musicals in general and which ones work the best and why. Mm-hmm. What, what are your personal yeah. thoughts on jukeboxes, Benita? Um, I'm a little bit with uh, Henry. All right. A little bit. I mean, look, Henry says jukebox musicals can be a lazy way to make a musical when done poorly, but can also be a fun way to repurpose popular music into the theater narrative. And I will agree. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, and it's like anything, you know, it, it's still. And when, before we continue on with them, do you think that it's a great way to make theater um, accessible to those who think, oh, I don't like that stuff, it's theater? Yes, I say so like begrudgingly and rolling my eyes <laughs> because I, I do think that's why they've become so popular because it's pulling in younger crowds, it's pulling in more diverse crowds who are, you know, like, oh, I like this music. So, you know, I would go to a concert of that, you know, but that group is no longer performing or, you know, whatever. Right. So I'll go, I'll go check it out in New York City, you know, uh, whereas they wouldn't want to go see, you know, Come From Away or Wicked or, you know, something like that. Is that so bad? 
Yeah. I mean, to each their own, right. You know, so uh, yeah, they, they exist. I, I wish there weren't as many as there are, but, but you know, let me, it's expensive to mount. Yeah. Musical. Yes. And taking that leap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you got, I mean, I mean, Henry goes on to say that um, the ones I found most successful are those that tell the story of the artist that wrote the perform performed the music, like Jersey Boys and Beautiful, or those that start with the music and build a story around them. Mamma Mia, uh, Across the Universe, Moulin Rouge to me is an exception that it was successful for one reason was because they did not limit themselves to one musical artist. Yeah. You know, and yeah. the hubs who loves theater turned to me during watched both the paper and, you know, uh, the commercial and he turned to me and goes, we got to go see Moulin Rouge. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. See, I think I'm in the minority here because um, I kind of remember Adam telling us about he saw it and it was kind of like a concert and people were like cheering every time they recognized a new song. Yeah. And I've heard, you know, like the love duet um, on Sirius XM radio and seeing the number. I personally was like, let's just pick a song and st stick with it. Yeah. And you know what? And again, my husband will listen, you know, long day's journey and tonight, you know, the mm -hmm. Iceman cometh. I got to say, Mahabs is a serious theater goer. The spectacle of it. Yeah, it's, it's, like it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very grand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's going to pull in a lot of people, actually. Uh, let's see. Um, Patrick says, Jersey Boys, exceptionally good book, which the music was inextric inextricably integrated with. The form follows the function. The world goes round and the hills are alive with Rogers and Hammerstein are just huge collections of brilliant songs by these songwriting teams. Is it a review or jukebox musical? I'm going with review. Yeah, I think those are, I would label those as reviews. I think you have to have a story through line. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, Kay says uh, the most I would say for the shows vying for best musical this year is that they represented the slice of the genre producers feel safe opening ahead of major holiday seasons, jukebox, movie-based, or otherwise pre-sold name. Now, these are the shows that will generally have enough advance to carry through the, uh, the usual January, February slump. Overall, uh, the thought about jukebox musicals, I prefer ones with an integrated plot, Jersey Boys, Beautiful, there we go. In fairness, mm -hmm. all three best musicals this year were that. None of them were a review. That said, I do understand people who just like jukebox musicals for not pushing the art form forward. They draw on pre-established material. The audiences are either primed to love or hate before they've seen even a minute of the show. In that lot, light jukebox musicals are by their nature polarizing. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You know, I find personally the, the ones I enjoy the most are the artists I'm not as familiar with. Um, I'm a huge Billy Joel fan and moving out was a big disappointment for me because I basically felt like I was watching someone who wasn't Billy Joel just sing all his songs, you know? And then, um, and then seeing Beautiful, I knew very little about Carole King and uh, the fact that she wrote so many songs that she yeah. didn't actually perform and that the musical incorporated those songs as well as ones she sung. I learned a lot in that show and I was very touched by her story. So was that a jukebox musical or was that an autobiographical musical that incorporated her songs? Yeah. Maybe it is in a slightly different category. You know, I mean, it's a painful story. Yeah. yeah. Just think, just throwing it out there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's see, uh, Lori says, I'm generally not a fan. I much prefer a musical and story that are created together rather than a story designed to showcase well-known songs. That being said, many of the early musicals were jukebox in nature using popular songs by the Gershwins and Irving Berlin. Got a point. Yeah. Got a point. 
Mm -hmm. Take Linda too. What does Linda say? Uh, Linda says, I suspect that these grew from the complexities of licensing songs for theater. Unless something has changed recently, dramatic rights to songs have to be licensed for each production and are based on the size of the theater, et cetera. Also, some songs are licensed through ASCAP yeah. ASAP, and some through BMI, et cetera. It's cumbersome and most theater producers don't want to get involved with just one song writer. It's no big deal. You know, something else to consider. And Bethany says jukebox musicals should be their own category. I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised a few years down the line if there is like a split, you know, um, of like pre-existing material, like movies, jukebox yeah. musicals, and then like a- Sondheim time over here, jukebox and musicals. <laughs> I can't wait to see his new music, to hear the music. <gasps> And his, right? Mm hmm. Oh, can't I mean, believe he's still riding. It's amazing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You got Siobhan? Uh, yeah, Siobhan says, Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia. But for reals, I think original stories set to the music of a singular artist works best, like Mamma Mia or Jagged Little Pill. But not every artist makes music that's good for a jukebox musical. Like the more pop the music, the less interested I am in it. It feels more shallow. I don't know if that makes sense, but no, I, I get it. Sure. You know, um, the flip side is some, I'll play devil's advocate. You know, I just have to. Some might say that some of the, some musicals that were written strictly as musicals are insipid. Mm -hmm. You know, so... <laughs> yeah. But your point's well taken. Her point's mm -hmm. very well taken. Jessica says, I do put them in a lower level of legit than original musicals, but they can be fun. Uh, Mamma Mia is obviously top of its class. Moulin Rouge has always been a personal favorite of mine, and I love the Broadway cast recording. They updated the songs extremely well, and the arrangements are perfect. Danny Burstein is so amazing on it too. And I can't wait to see it on tour next year. And it just got to take a moment. His acceptance speech, did that have you in tears? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, the, both the personal note about losing his wife and the community mm -hmm. that theater can be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we've all missed during the pandemic. It was one thing to do Zoom stuff. Mm -hmm. It's it's not the same. No, no. no. Let's see. Uh, Sean says a jukebox musical works best when it doesn't feel like the plot was shoehorned in. I love Billy Joel and the Beach Boys, but moving out in good vibrations felt a lot like the writers had some great songs that they were trying to string together by any means necessary and wound up creating superficial or nonsensical stories. Otherwise, they work well with a naturally flowing story. A biographical piece is easy, Jersey Boys, but something original and grounded can work well too, Jagged Little Pill. And if the work isn't limited to a single artist like Moulin Rouge, the creative freedom it provides offers more options for story and music choice, provided that the writer maintains control of the story they're trying to tell. Too much liberty can lead to something spectacular, but nonsensical. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Conway says, I'll chime in and say that if the songs make the plot and the rest of the story just around them in it, it can work well too. American Idol is a good example oh, of this. American idiot, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I said idol. <laughs> <laughs> Even watch that, American idiot, yeah. They'll probably um, be an American yeah. idol show someday on Broadway. <laughs> Somebody will do a musical on that. But American idiot, yeah, he's a spot on. Mm -hmm. And that didn't feel like a jukebox musical somehow, maybe because- Oh, really? I haven't seen it. Oh, oh okay. That's a, that's a for sure. Oh, okay. Is this family coming up? <laughs> yeah, this is my mom. <laughs> my mom says jukebox musicals can be fun, but I prefer to see a show with new original music. I think producers are trying to keep it safe by putting up shows with music that they know already has a fan base. Same thing with turning a successful movie into a Broadway show. It can certainly work like Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Spam-A-Lot, but it seems like a bit of a cop-out. 
considering the cost of mounting a Broadway musical, I can understand why producers want to go with something that has a proven fan base, but I miss the originality of a new show. I want to go home singing new songs, not the same things I hear on the radio every day. Your mom is so smart. She is. That's like, she, she wrote it better than I could say it. <laughs> I want to thank um, all the people. We've got some, a lot of new uh, folks responding. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, please, you know, keep uh, sharing your thoughts with us and bring your friends. Definitely. You know, it's funny. I, I was quickly looking up before we started recording a list of jukebox musicals. Um, and uh, cause I, uh, the comment about there used to be a lot in the old days and, uh, you know, there's like a handful seventies, eighties, nineties, but then you hit the two thousands and the list is epically long and then you hit the you know 2010s and the list gets even longer and it's just really interesting to see how that hit so so hard in the millennium and um and I did want to share because I was looking at like what artists were done and what the names were and this one I was like what is this show in 2014 there was one called Cyrano de Burger Shack <laughs> featuring songs from Carly Rae Jepsen and Smash Mouth that's like a Saturday Night Live routine. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I got to I got to get a hold of that. <laughs> but, you know, then that's disproves that just because it played on radio. Right. It'll translate into money. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot on here I have not heard of. So I don't know where. Give me with another shot. Did, but... What else you got on that list? Uh, oh, my goodness. Let's see. Um. You know, I didn't realize that Xanadu is a jukebox musical. Did you know that? No. Because it says Electric Light Orchestra and Olivia Newton-John. I didn't realize, it, but that music, okay. Yeah, I yeah, I was confused by that one. We'll have to do a little more research into that one. Um, oh, you know, one on this list that I actually kind of loved um, and I feel bad because I think it got very overshadowed was um, Head Over Heels. Um, which featured the music from the Go-Go's. It was on Broadway in 2018 and it was a trip I took with my mom and there wasn't tons that we were excited to see. And I saw a picture from it and I was like, that looks crazy, let's go see that. And it was one that like the music was fun and the arrangements were great, but they just put together the wackiest, you know, silliest plot. And like the show itself was just so fun that the music right. like added to just the party that was going on. Um, you still need a book. Yeah, you do. You know, and a, yeah, a good book too, because I, you know, once upon a time in, in London saw uh, We Will Rock You and uh, that's Queen's music. And I was so disappointed because I felt, you know, the quintessential Queen song is uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, which is basically a story on its own. Like what great material right. to build a musical on. They didn't sing it the whole show. And then at the end they did curtain call and they're like, we're gonna do an encore and sang Bohemian Rhapsody. And I felt it was such a cheap, I was like, why, why didn't you use that great story with like dialogue and back and forth? Right, that would make its own wonderful show. Yeah, yeah. So I think someone needs to revisit a Queen musical, <laughs> do, it, do it a little better. Right? Well, yeah. you know, Tommy worked. Oh yeah. Yeah, I love Tommy. Because they stayed true to the, they told the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like you're saying about Queen and Bohemian Rhapsody, they didn't, in a sense, build the book around it. Mm -hmm. It was your through. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So that's interesting. Let's see, let's see what some of them that are coming up. Um, there's a Tom Jones one called What's New Pussycat coming up. Whoa, uh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> there's a, a Bob Marley hey, one. Are, I got to ask, do you think women are going to show up and throw panties? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> You know, they threw panties at him <laughs> at his concerts. Oh my gosh. Wow. Mm -hmm. Who knows? People dance in the aisles during Mamma Mia. So yeah. Uh, there's a Britney Spears one coming up. Once upon a once more time. Oh, sorry. Once upon a one more time. Uh, Michael Jackson. Yes. MJ, they're MJ selling. The musical. Yeah, yeah. They're still already selling that one. Yeah. So it's coming up and then and as we said you know it's kind of in the same 
boat as the movie made musical. And there's a lot of those coming out too. So it's definitely becoming a popular trend, as we said, because it's it's a way to get new audience. It's a kind of guaranteed, well, sometimes guaranteed ticket seller. Just depends if yeah. it's a but good adaptation. Know, the, whole, the whole issue of audience, and maybe we throw that out as a question. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we're both steeped in local theater, and it's a conversation that goes on all the time. Is how do you attract? a new audience? How do you engage the younger audience to come and not just dip their toes, but to immerse themselves and become, if you will, frequent bathers, you know, that you you really, you take to the water. Mm -hmm. Um, And at the same time, you can't throw out those who have been coming for years so will they continue to come no matter what you put up there because they're so committed to live theater? I don't know. These are questions that, that you know, as, as the president of a, a theater company, you as a director, we, we struggle with. Yeah. And I mean, I, me personally, I feel like shows such as Hamilton, you know, are so successful because they are original music, original content, but it's got that following you know, as if Lin-Manuel Miranda was a solo artist and it was a collection of his work, you know, it's, yeah. it has that draw as did Rent back in the day, um, right. as it sounds like Six, I haven't seen Six, but it sounds like it's got that huge following already, even though it's just opening up on Broadway. So yeah. to me, that feels like the way to go as opposed to keep throwing out more and more jukebox musicals, but it's, it's hard to come across those. Those are a dime a dozen. Yeah. So, you know, what, everybody let us know. What do you think? What do you think is the answer? How do you cultivate and keep the next generation? I love that. Coming into the theater. Please tell me because I don't know how. <laughs> and, you know, we're all throwing the linguine on the wall mm-hmm. and hoping that it sticks. And do, is it an age? Do we have to be more aggressive about bringing theater into schools you know is is that because taking kids to see a show may not be possible for Mm -hmm. myriad reasons so companies that record and share it is is that good enough do you have to see the actor in the flesh yeah yeah and i think you know i love traveling groups that go into schools but then you gotta you gotta train your students. I know I was always annoyed when groups would come into my high school because I loved that it was my favorite day of the year, and I was like, all right, I can't wait to see the show. And then people in the audience would have like laser pointers and be pointing them at the actors and things like that because they were never they you know never been told like etiquette. That's and, a really you know. good point. It's, that's a great point, Ellen. So which class should be teaching about how to respond? respond how to be an audience does that happen in English class yeah you know while you're learning literature it's not just learning the words but learning how to respect it Mm. Mm mm-hmm you know yeah who was it once I'm trying to think it may have been and I'm sure she was repeating somebody's um words but Ida Faella from L'Ensemble wonderful soprano they did performed for a long time in the capital region and beyond and she said that the opening of a candy is a statement on the performance (laughs) and i've heard that about a cough the cough sometimes you can't but if you're sitting there opening candy during the performance Mm. Yep. And, but you have to be taught that. Mm-hmm. I mean, like the guy who put his boots up, his feet up on the stage at Albany Civic Low so many years ago. Yeah. What a dude. You're not at home. Get your mm-hmm. feet off, you know, and stop scratching. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I know that um, you know, since we heard from my mom this episode, uh, she, is a huge believer that food should not be sold at at theaters and i'm i'm with her 
I know that it brings in extra revenue, but there's nothing worse than be watching a show that you're invested in. And then someone next to you starts unwrapping something and eating it. <laughs> but you know, in England, you can buy your liquor. And yeah. Now it's here, you know, they sit there and that's, maybe that's not so bad sometimes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Just no, just no crunchy things, right? <laughs> like, just keep, keep no wrappers, no crunchies. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Make that the, uh, the uh, I'm taking a look as we're talking. Barrington Stage has um, a crossing, a dance musical hmm. that audience us are raving about, created in association with Calpulli Mexican Dance Company. Um, it runs through the 16th of October at the Boyd Quinson stage in Pittsfield. So where does that fit in? Oh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, we saw, was it Tango a number of years ago? I think it was called Tango. It was a lot of Tango. Hmm. Um, then you've got stuff like this. Yeah. Theater, but in a different fashion. Yeah, different art forms. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. And actually, I was going to say, speaking of things coming up, I saw Playhouse Stage Company's season. And speaking of Head Over Heels, they're going to be doing it. So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And of course, deals with uh, transgender. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, again, you know, looking at an audience, you know, so building a younger audience, speaking to a diverse world. Yeah. You know, uh, it's not easy, is it? It's not. <laughs> it's hard to create. <laughs> it's hard to create. And to create something that will appeal. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I'm just I'm just taking a quick scroll to see is there anything else? Any other? A lot of a lot of stuff auditioning. Mm, mm -hmm. You look on backstage, so I think that's probably an exciting thing to see. Yeah. Um. To give you a sense, that's who we've got. Get tickets from $69 for James Lapine's new Broadway musical, Flying Over Sunset. 1950s Hollywood, Cary Grant, Claire Bluth, Booth Luce, Adullis Huxley are all about to take off on the trip of their lives. What do you think? Well, it's interesting. That's kind of like a, a different thing of, you know, speaking of reusing material you know like reusing famous people you know names that are recognizable yeah it features a score written by tony award winner tom kitt he did next to normal and tony nominee michael corey from gray gardens hmm this will be interesting. Yeah. And Michelle Dorrance makes her Broadway debut as the show's choreographer. Yes, <laughs> bring it. Nice. <laughs> right? Fantastic. Um, you know, and it'll be at, uh, let's see, I think it's at um, Lincoln Center. Oh, lovely. So that's one to look to. Yeah. Begins, previews begin November 11th. But it's it's in that vein of what we've been discussing. Yeah, yeah. So, all kinds of theater, everything theater. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> yeah. Listen, by the by, a reminder: if you would like to advertise with us, uh, send us a note. Our rates are cheap, our, but we get it out there. We do. <laughs> Affordable, Excellent. not cheap. Rates are affordable. I like yes. that. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, I'm Ellen Cripps. And I'm Benita Zahn. We'll check, we'll check in with you next time.
Thank you so much for listening to the Everything Theater Podcast. Special thanks goes out to Alice Grinling for our photography and Justin Friello for composing our amazing theme song. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you want to share your thoughts or what's going on in your theater community, you can reach out to us on social media or through our email at everythingtheaterpodcast at gmail.com. Till next time. It's everything, 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 everything.